they are being seen as people serving a righteous king. Someone who, who they want to believe is good, someone whom they want to follow, someone whom they want to say makes a difference in our world. And, and one of the things that most of us want to do is make a difference in the world, somehow, some way. We want to leave our footprint, our thumbprint, whatever you want to call it. And, and, and when we serve under a king who is good and righteous, we seem to serve the cause of righteousness itself. And while King Arthur is a fantasy, Jesus Christ is a reality. Amen. And he is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the one who sits on the throne in heaven. God Almighty himself is our king. And because he is our king, because there is a righteous Lord on the throne, you and I, as people called by his name, called out of the very presence of darkness into the kingdom of light, we serve a righteous king far greater than King Arthur ever was imagined to be. And we can understand this king and his plans for this world and we will read his word and apply it to our lives. So this morning we're going to go to 1 Chronicles 29 verse 11 and we're going to look at what it means to be a part of this kingdom of God. How you and I are in this kingdom and we are a part of it. So as you find it, go ahead and stand with us. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11. Verse 11, chapter 29, 1 Chronicles says, Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty. For everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. And you are exalted as head over all. Let's pray. So, Father God, we thank you for this word today. And we ask that, Lord, as we examine this doctrine of the kingdom of God, um, just briefly here, and not even as much in depth as we could or probably should, we ask, Lord God, that you just teach us from it, encourage us from it, and draw us forward into our faith. And we ask that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You can be seated. When we talk about the kingdom, what we have to understand is every kingdom, in order to be a kingdom, has to have a king. You have to have one who sits on the throne in, in that kingdom, whether a king, a queen, a, a, some sort of lord, or a sovereign. But there's always a leader. And in earthly kingdoms, the right to rule has often been disputed, and great wars have been fought over the very throne that sits in the throne room. Many have claimed to be king. And in truth, some might have even been earthly kings and sat on those thrones, but none have done what Jesus Christ has done as King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the only true king. He is the only king. God over all of the universe. He is the only one who, as we see here, as David wrote, he says, Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. Or if you got the KJV, I believe it's like this. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. Here is a king, David, over a nation, Israel, that at the time is one of the more powerful nations in the world. And he says, You're my king. And, and this man who has Many servants underneath him is actually looking to the Lord God and saying, I am your servant. I am one who is no more and no less than anyone else in this world because I serve you just as you have called me to do so. And so when David uses this word Lord, he is not talking just of God the Father. Um, he's not really aware of God the Son in so much. And he knows about the Holy Spirit, but he is applying it to the whole Trinity. You see, the whole Trinity is king. It's not God the Father is king or Jesus is king. It's the whole Trinity. And while you and I often might not think of the Holy Spirit as king, because he is a part of the Trinity, and the Trinity is fullness in and of itself, and what we find is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in, how many? Three in one. Therefore, if God is king, the Holy Spirit is king. So we have one king who has revealed himself to us in three ways, but it is still one king. And so what we have here is 
David recognizing that God is king over all the earth. The people of earth may rebel against him. The people of earth may reject him. And as we look at our world, we see that many of the world does it their own thing in accordance to religion, in accordance to the stuff of life. But Isaiah 45, 23 tells us that every knee shall bow one day to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the king. Many have sought to be worshipped. Nebuchadnezzar sought to be worshipped. Had that big statue built for him, remember? And, and then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego defied him and got thrown into the fiery furnace. Napoleon tried to conquer the known world at the time, or at least Europe. He wanted to be king and in many ways wanted to be worshipped and didn't work out that way. Hitler followed the same path. Pol Pot, Lenin, Stalin. Take your pick of any of the despots of the, the last two centuries. And you can see all of them wanted to be something more than they were. We've had multiple people claim to be Jesus Christ, some out of their head, others truly believing that they were a reincarnation of, of Christ, David Koresh, and way back in the 80s, if y'all remember him, and others who have said, oh, I'm the Messiah, and yet each one have been proven false. There is no new Jesus. There's only this Jesus of Scripture. And according to Scripture, he sits at the right hand of the Father right now, waiting for the day in which God says to come back and to reinstitute that which is broken, that which was, in a sense, stolen by Satan, because Satan disputes God's kingship. The, the, the war in heaven was about Satan wanting to be God. Even though he was a created being by God, put into this um, creation and spoken into it by the Lord himself, he sought to usurp the authority of God to take away God's position as king, and of course he lost. And scripture says that he was tossed out of heaven and was thrown to earth, and he still roams today around this world seeking whom he may devour. He calls himself the prince of this world and the ruler of this age, according to Ephesians. And in Luke 4, 6, and 7, we find that he even tempted Jesus to worship him. Hey, if you will worship me, I'll give you the whole world, which Jesus kind of already owned. You know, he's offering Christ something that he already had in his hands. And so uh, you know that as he is tempted, Jesus rebukes him with the word of God, and eventually Satan has to flee because he can't stand up against the truth. He can't stand up against the true God, the one who truly sits on the throne. And Satan disputes this, this claim of Christ, this claim of God to be king. And, and as, as a result, we see the turmoil in our world. That the evil in our world is a direct uh, result of the rebellion of Satan against God. And then he came down to earth, he convinced Adam to sin, and there now we are where we're at. And we look at this world, we see wars, we see crime, we see all this other evil in the world, and it follows itself all the way back down to the foot of Satan, the one who instigated it all, because he wants to be king. But he will not be king. In fact, Scripture tells us that there is an end result for Satan, and that is one day he shall be cast into the lake of fire. Um, he, he lies to himself and says he's going to win. But truthfully, is he, he knows the word better than any of us. And he knows that the word proclaims his doom. And that he will one day be cast into that lake of fire. In fact, the in, very incarnation of Christ, Christ proves Satan is a liar. 1 John 3, 8 tells us this. It says, the one who commits sin is of the devil... For the devil has sinned from the beginning. And the Son of God has revealed, was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the devil's works. So we see four things there just real quick. The person who sins is of the devil. So if a person is not a Christian, no matter how good they are, no matter how, how much they think they follow God, if they have never received Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, this verse clearly says that they are in the camp of Satan. That there, there's no way to, to avoid this. So in this world, there's two types of people. Those who are sinners in the camp of Satan and those who are saved in the camp of Christ. 
That's it. There's no middle road. We'll say, that guy's really good. He's probably going to earn his way to salvation. You can't do it. You have to have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So that's first. The second thing is the devil has sinned from the beginning of time. Now, we, we know as time began when God began to create all of this, but before that you had God who had created the angels in the heavens. We don't know exactly the whole timeline there because the Bible doesn't tell us. But what we do know is that Satan was cast from heaven into to down to here so that we might have to deal with what's going on in the spiritual war. And he drug us into it. And now he has led us into sin, and here we are in the spiritual warfare that continues to this day. But Jesus came because the lies of Satan, and he wanted to fix that which was broken. You have a, a, an entire Old Testament that points to the coming of a Savior, that points to the coming of a Christ, who is going to fix part of what is broken. But he didn't do that when he was first here. What he did was give us an example. He showed us a way of salvation and, and a manner in which we can work towards that which is good, holy, and right in a broken and, and despised and despicable world. He did that for us. But the day is coming, as we said a while ago, he's going to come back and replace all of this stuff. So Jesus comes to destroy the work of Satan. He does it today. How do I know this? Because you and I used to be sinners in, this, in the camp of Satan. But because of grace, because of salvation through faith in Christ and Christ alone, we have left the camp of Satan and entered the, the kingdom of God. We have become soldiers. We have become children of God. And that is a revelation that Jesus destroys the work of Satan for his work is to bring sin and shame. That the work of Satan is to, to, to reveal in us, oh, we're such horrible, bad people that we don't deserve anything, any grace, any mercy. And he's right. Because it is love that brought salvation to you and I. Not because we earned anything, but because Jesus said, I want to give it to you. Because I love you and I cherish you. You are the crown of my creation. And where Satan hates all of humanity and desires to destroy us, Christ loves all of humanity and desires to save all of us. Unfortunately, not that many come to true sadness. And if it had not been for Satan, it's very possible Adam and Eve would still be in the garden. We'd still be enjoying the, the whole fruits of the whole thing that was going on. We'd be filling the earth with his glory and, and honoring him face to face, much as we would do in heaven. But that's not the case. And when you have a king who has a kingdom, as you see there, point, your second point, is there must be territory. Any king reigns over a certain amount of area. You look at the history of our world and you see you have the, the king of Spain, the king of France, the king of England, and you could draw a designated line around where they were. And while oftentimes those borders might have shifted a little bit, they've kind of stayed the same over the hundreds of years that those kings were there. Um, just battles force this that way then that way it, it changed uh, every now and then but nothing really changed um, absolutely but then we look at God and we say where is God's territory well before all of this existed there was just God in his fullness in his trinity he, he was there and then he spoke all of this in the being so everything that you and I know all of this creation that he has made that's under the authority of God. It is his kingdom. You and I are his subjects. Whether we bow a knee right now or not, we're still his subjects. And you and I as Christians, we, we are acceptable subjects. We are the ones who have entered the kingdom. We are the ones who will see salvation and eternal life. But even those who have rejected him will still, as I said a while ago, bow that knee to him and be subject to him even as they are cast into hell. So while we may not understand why God allows the evil in this world, why God allows sickness and so forth, all these things, the truth is he's still on his throne and he's in charge. He reigns over all. So it's not an earthly kingdom. John 18, 36 says, My kingdom is not of this world, as Jesus is speaking. And Jesus, by saying these words, equate himself with God the Father. 
My kingdom is not of this world. Our kingdom, the, the Trinity's kingdom is not of this world. It is everything that we have created. Nothing exists that we have not created. And while France, England, and Germany, and all those had those boundaries, God says, I have no boundaries. It's all mine. And if you guys want to play around and be petty and think you know where this border is or that border is and, and fight among yourself, you forget that I'm, I'm in charge. And all your wars mean nothing in the end because it's not an earthly kingdom. In fact, all the universe of David says it right here in 29.11, 1 Chronicles 29.11. You know, he, he gives these, this definition of God in, in, in his limited sense. And he says, Lord is the greatness and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty. All these things are yours, Lord. Then he says, for everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. Here's this little bitty human sitting on earth who looks up to the heavens and thinks to himself, God owns all of that. In fact, he owns everything I can see. He goes to the top of his, his, uh, his castle there and he looks out, his, his fortress, and he can see for miles because it's up on the mountain. <clears throat> and he thinks all of that belongs to God. God's kingdom doesn't know earthly boundaries. Because he is God. He's over all. And it's, the whole universe is his. And all that is in that created order is his as well. Now as far as you and I know, we're the only intelligent aspect of the whole created order. If there is anything out there which is doubtful, because I think he would have told us in scripture, um, then it is under his authority as well. If there's normal, you know, like plant life or animal life out on some other planet, which that makes sense, actually, that is still under his authority. All, in all of the creation, every aspect from, from here to the very deepest part of, of the universe, wherever, if there is an edge, which I doubt, because of who God is, he has it all under his authority. And everyone will acknowledge him. Colossians 3.15 says that we are to allow God to rule over our hearts. We have willingly submitted to salvation through Jesus Christ. When we voiced that desire to be saved by grace, he received us into his kingdom. And in, in essence, he even knighted us. You know, you've seen it where the, the, the knight kneels and you, you, they put the shoulder here and, the, and they tap the shoulder there with the sword and, and the guy's probably praying, just please don't sneeze while you do this. You know, because he don't want his head cut off. But here what we see is you and I, we became Christians, saved into the kingdom and knighted into his work. Saved into his service. And, and as you see with King Arthur and other um, movies and books like that where the, the king will send the heroes off on the quest, you and I have been quested by God. Where we've been given a quest to go into this world to bring glory and honor into his name. To tell others about Jesus Christ. And for those who rebel against him, they will be held accountable one day. But you see, we are the subjects. Your third point there. We are the subjects of the kingdom. Part of our quest is to pray for this kingdom to come. How do we know that? Matthew chapter 6 verse 10 says we are to pray your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You and I are to be praying that his work here on earth will take place. That his glory will be seen and that his will will be obeyed as it is in heaven. Even in our own life. And to this day, the church works to honor God in this sense. That we pray that his will will be done. There are many churches out there that say, oh, we're, we're following God. We're the church of God, and yet they reject His Word. Are they really a church of God? That answer is no. They're lying to themselves, just as the father of lies lies to himself about where he is going to be one day. You and I are a part of this kingdom, and while we draw breath, we are to be 
praying for the kingdom. We're gonna we're supposed to pray for it to grow. Now, now in, in the old days, the way that kingdom grew is because the, the king declared war on his neighbors and went and took land. Well, truthfully, is there is a spiritual war going on right now around us that you and I can't see. There is a war between the, the heavens and the demonic forces. And while God is all-powerful, and at any moment just can spam, it'd be over. But for whatever reason, He chooses not to do that. He chooses to allow the war to rage in order that you and I might participate in it in some form and fashion. We were saved by grace so that we might not just pray for the kingdom of God, that we might glorify His name, but that we might fight the enemy by His power. And, and the enemy is far stronger than any of us. He, he can overcome us at any moment. And the only reason he does not is because God stays his hand. And the, the authority that you and I might have is actually God's authority that he has passed to us so that we might stand against the arrows of the enemy. That we might stand strong. That we might stand firm. And that as we are Given quest, Keith, go minister to that person. Go, go tell this person about Jesus Christ. Pray with this person. Encourage that person. These are the quests, the, the calling of God upon the Christian to do these things in order that he might be honored and glorified. We continue to do it knowing that the enemy is there. And that's why we need to understand that the quest, the calling, is indeed dangerous. So, oh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm good. God's not going to send me anything dangerous. Did, have you re ever read the Word? God sent people into danger all the time. And some of them died. You know, so it's like, oh, God's not going to do this, but He will. In fact, He even told the disciples in Luke 10, chapter, chapter, chapter 10, verses 2, 2 and 3, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are, for, are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the heart to send out workers in the harvest. Then he says this, now go. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. I'm sending you out, you're going to get ate up. You're, you're going to get bit. You're going to get chewed on. And you might even die. But go in my name. And all will be well, even if you die. After Pentecost and the falling of the Holy Spirit, the persecution of the church started, and Stephen was the first one to be martyred, they thought, hey, this, this was pretty well received. Let's kill another one. And they took one of the apostles, they took James, and they brought him up to the very highest point of the temple, and they threw him off. And while he did that, while that was done, as he fell, the angels could have caught him and made him land safely. A miracle of all miracles. A, an incredible thing could have happened. But instead, as he was thrown off, he fell and was dashed to the ground and died. Martyred. A sheep among wolves who took his life. You and I are called to a dangerous task. You, you think this world loves you as Christians? That answer is no. They want nothing more than for you to fail and to falter. They want nothing more for, for us to, to go down in flames. And yet we, the knights of God, are to take up the armor that God has given us and to go forth in the battle. In fact, he even speaks of that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 through 17, where it says, put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the tactics of of the devil. For our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world powers of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavens. This is why you must take up the full armor of God, so that you may be able to resist the evil day, and having prepared everything, to take your stand. Stand, therefore, with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest, and your feet sandaled with the readiness for the gospel of peace. In every situation, take the shield of faith, and with it you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word. 
Do, do you not think that God put this in here to remind us that we are his knights? This is, this is knight wording. This is evidence that God has chosen us and is sending us in the battle. You and I have been chosen. We are in this kingdom and we fight for his glory. And in the end, we will die. Unless he comes back. And then we'll still semi-die as our, our bodies change to perfection. But we serve him. And we serve at his pleasure. And when he is finished, he calls us home. He takes us and says, well done, good and faithful servant. And our job is done and others carry on the task. For it is an ongoing task. Others will be knighted. Others will be brought forth. And they will go forth and proclaim his kingdom. Let's pray.